Good evening. We're going to continue what we were doing from last week. And uh, if we're successful, it should confound you as it has me. Two parts of the Republic. One part deals with the conditions that must be established before the quest of true philosophy can begin. That's what we did last week. And I'm going to go back over it to pull some things out of it so I can create the kind of a problem that I think Plato is doing when he's designing and uh, developed the Republic. Now, subject tonight was the Republic, the rising of the soul into the region of mind. And that's what we have to try to show. That's really what the Republic is all about. Not about <clears throat> designing an ideal state, because the state is not ideal, that he generates, as he himself says. So what kind of a work, therefore, are we dealing with so that we can focus on it and play with it tonight? It is a work that assumes that you're interested in and have a curiosity about the transformative powers that bring about an integration and establish the conditions for vision. That's what he's doing in Plato's Republic. There are two sets of problems. The old one-many problem and the other is between belief and knowing. I'd like to get into this problem of belief now and <clears throat> kind of in doing that, go back over what we did before. <clears throat> and as we go, I'll highlight a couple of things as we go to have a little fun. The primary challenge of the Republic is to try to grasp the nature of justice and injustice. So last week we talked about justice, temperance, bravery, and wisdom. I'd like to go back over it now to focus on a few things. In the Republic, he is on a particular interesting quest. The way he describes it is, what are we seeking for in justice? But a power and a power which can produce such men as those men that can go from Hades to heaven, as he calls it, or rising of the mind into the realm of being. Now, as he talks about justice, just to review it, he says the primary idea of justice is to do one's own business in oneself. And the whole point, therefore, is what kind of business is it that you must do in yourself? He says there are three parts of man, right? The desires, spirited part, and the rational part. He said, what one must do is bring these three parts and bind them together. And he uses this expression, to make oneself a one out of many. Then he says, what you have to then do is you have to believe, remember what we said about belief? You have to believe and name as just and beautiful dealings whatever practice preserves this condition and works along with it. All right, now, that means, here's a beautiful picture of the soul, as you can see. Right, the rational part, the spirited part. And, of course, the desire. Now, whatever, whatever practice preserves this condition of making a oneness out of these three so that they are not at odds one with the other, whatever practice that does that and preserves that condition of oneness, that's justice. That's justice. See. That's, and what do you get for it? You get a power that produces a power. 
how this produces a power. Uh, this is very similar uh, in Buddhism when one unifies the mind. A power is generated out of that unification of the mind and that's called jiriki. Same idea, same idea. Now temperance, he describes as whatever the ruler, which is the rational part, and the two ruled, the spirited part and the desires, whenever the ruler and the two ruled are of one mind, of one mind and agree, and one mind and agree that the reasoning part ought to rule, when that takes place in your psyche, that's temperance. That's what temperance is. It's a resolvement. When the struggle is over, when the struggle is over between these three, and the struggle therefore is over in the sense of a victory, when the rational therefore can then be an ally with the spirited and together they can work with the desires to achieve a oneness. That condition, see that condition of the state of the soul, it's a condition, right? it's a condition of the soul. That's what he calls suffer sune or temperance. Let me direct, direct your attention again to a couple of words. Right? Injustice, it's a certain power. Right? It's a power when the three parts are bound together, make oneself a one out of many, right? one out of many. And then you have to believe and name as just and beautiful dealings. Whatever practice preserves this condition and works along with it. This presupposes that the internal warfare between these three has been settled because this suggests that whenever the ruler and the true ruled are one, 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 right, then the reasoning ought to rule. That is temperance, a condition of the soul. Bravery, remember what we said about bravery. Remember this is a very curious idea of bravery. It's difficult to hold on to this. And we need it. All right, what is bravery? Again, notice, look here, see? It's the same language, see? Practice and preserves. Practice and preserves. All right? Here, again, a, whatever preserves, it's a practice, again, that preserves through pleasure and pain, desire and fear, Reasons, teachings, excuse me, there should be reasons, teachings, I goofed, right? Reasons, teachings, as to what is really dangerous or not. And what is really dangerous or not in the Republic is established by the law, the lawgivers. Right? That's established by the lawgivers. Well, to read the Republic, it's a very interesting work in the way in which it's structured. You have to now go back into the Republic, this is the fourth book, and you have to reason and say to yourself, <clears throat> now for this to make sense there must have been some discussion in some earlier part of the work that talks about lawgivers and the need to establish certain kinds of laws. And the laws they must be establishing must be so clearly dealing with the question of what is dangerous and what is not. Because unless you can identify in the preceding section, this section doesn't make any difference. Pardon me, it doesn't make any, it's, it's not significant. Because notice what it's saying. See, you have to preserve through pleasure and pain, desire and fear, what reason, reason's teachings as to what is really dangerous or not. And unless you know what the lawgivers established, that what is really dangerous and established a law in order to make sure that man can understand that and in include it within himself, this doesn't make any sense. So what do we need to know? There is something, therefore, that is extremely dangerous. It's really dangerous. It's reason's teachings. Now reason has, reason, 
a certain reasoning has brought us to a certain conclusion. Our reasoning has brought us to a conclusion. That conclusion must take the expression of law. It must deal with what is considered to be the most dangerous thing of all. And unless we can establish that, we won't be able to deal with the bravery of this. Now, it still is a preserving, 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 so we need to know, all right, what is the most dangerous thing? Because it turns out, in the way in which Plato talks about it, it is a lie. That's what's dangerous. It's a lie. What he means by a lie is very interesting. What's most dangerous is to possess a lie, to have a lie, to possess a lie, to have a false idea, to be ignorant about something that is most essential. These are all the same. These are all the same. To be ignorant about something and to believe that thing that you're ignorant about is true about something most important, that's something both the gods and men would most hate. It's a false idea. Therefore, if you have it and possess it, you possess a lie about something most important. And therefore, he's going to call that collectively a lie. Let's see what he calls it. See? What is truly a lie is hated by both gods and men. Well, what is that? See? What is truly a lie is hated by the gods and men. To be false in the most vital part of one's being, the soul, and about the most vital of all things, that's what it is to have a lie within your soul. So let us put it in here, all right? Let us say there is a lie in here, and we have to discover more about it. And, contrary wise, see if we can take that out and put out what he would regard as true. Now, notice, in the soul to be false and to be ignorant about what is real, that's a lie. So whatever you think is real, try it. Whatever you think is real, whatever it is, If you agree with what he thinks is, a, is, is real, then you have something about the nature of what is real which he would regard as true. If, however, contrary-wise, you have a different view of what's real and his, then he would say you're harboring in your soul a lie about what is real. Well, what does he mean by what is real? Well, in the end of Book Two in the Republic, Plato talks about the, the falsehoods that are in society. And he says the worst of all, most dangerous, the word becomes important, the most dangerous lie is about the nature of God and what is God's. So this is what he's saying now. All right? The most dangerous idea you can have, therefore, is a false conception about God and what is God's. So therefore, he evolves these ideas to the end of book two. God is the cause only of the good. God must be perfect in a perfect condition, no change. And what is God's is everywhere in a perfect state. God is two things, the highest excellence, highest beauty. No deception possible. Well then, look here. There's something then that is perfect. No change, changeless. And whatever is God's is in a perfect state. And uh, beauty, excellence, 
no deception. These words taken together, taken together, express exactly what he's describing here, but we can put it in other terms from the work we've done previously. What is God's, see what is God's, is everywhere in a perfect state. This is God's, it's in a perfect state. Right? God is the cause only of the good, therefore this must be good. Not the good, but must be good. Right? Causes only the good, excuse me. Now, what is this that's good, perfect, shameless, beauty, and, and excellence? That is the definition of ontos, being. That's being, which we discussed, remember, in the symposium in a startling, vivid, fantastic vision of beauty itself. This is called also the perfection of beauty. Remember the steps leading to a vision of beauty? It culminates in a vision of reality, right? He touches reality, that's reality. So therefore, this is what's real. Therefore, if you have that idea here, here it is. We'll put it in. We'll put it in. Now, what do you have to do with it? Well, let's go back. That's being, capital B. <clears throat> capital B. Uh, excuse me. No. Uh, oh, there it is, Brave. Thank you. There it is. Woo, I thought I put it on another page. Good, good, good. Now we go back to bravery. Okay. Therefore, a person who has this idea in their soul, right, they have that in their mind, and they preserve that idea, through, all right, now this, all right, this person now goes through four states. Pleasure, pain, <clears throat> pleasure and pain, desires, fears, This is what he goes through, therefore we'll put him in action. I'm always good at action and drawing pictures. Right. There the soul goes through. Right. Therefore, as you experience all pleasures, any pain whatsoever, all desires and all fears, what's the goal? Right. You have to keep in your mind what is really dangerous or not. <clears throat> therefore, if you have this idea in your mind, then you have an idea of what is not dangerous. All other ideas, therefore, are dangerous. Therefore, if you can go through, notice, this is not an avoidance, this is not a system of avoidance. He's not saying avoid pleasure and pain. He's not saying avoid desires and fears. He's saying, as you go through life and face these, what idea must you keep in your mind? This idea of what is real and what is being. Because being and real are the same words. Same word, same word. Now, if you can do that, then, notice then, you would then, is it not likely, have to keep uh, the three aspects of yourself as a oneness, because you wouldn't want to allow the desires to run free and unrestrained by this, because you want, you want to experience these things with this idea in mind. Therefore, to, to move through those four different states, in that kind of state in your soul, that is being brave.
doing that then, right, we can assume if temperance is there, then reason is in charge. Reason is in charge because it's holding on to what is real. Would you not agree that there are certain times if you face fears and pains, you may have a certain view about the nature of reality, which is that it's frightening and maybe evil and maybe harmful and all of these other things. He's saying, good heavens, that's the most dangerous view you can have. Because if you have that idea, then this experience of pain and fear then generates suffering. That's what generates suffering. It's because, pardon me, when you have, when you, when you find yourself in a situation that is fearful and in pain, if you then think that whatever is the cause of your pain and your fears is evil, demonic, in any way negative, therefore it's going to heighten the experience, is it not? And pain transforms into suffering. When we go to a dentist sometimes or for some kind of medical help, you may end up experiencing greater pains than you would normally in many situations. But if you were to think at the middle of that, whatever the process you're going through with your dentist, if you believe the dentist is really doing that because he's really in disguise and it's really a sadist and he just loves drilling teeth and he loves putting you through pain, what happens to your pain? It magnifies and therefore that produces suffering. Right, that produces suffering. So Plato is saying, look here, I have this. we have to deal with this problem. We have to cut through it. We have to go through it. We have to sidestep it. And the way to sidestep it is that you have an idea about the nature of what is real within your own soul. Now, this is really saying, is it not, if we keep to the language we had a moment ago, that means what is God and what is, go what is God's, God and what is God's, is perfect. That means, therefore, does it not, that this must be God's, right? Well, in metaphysics, being is the, uh, is the overflow of the one. It is the first creation. It is the first creation. Therefore, it is God's, it's the first creation. And in theology, of course, um, being also is the Logos, right? That's the Logos, right? And the Logos, of course, as you know, is another word for the first creation, because the Logos is the first creation, first son of God, Logos is the son of God, the first creation. All right, I just wanted to put that in for a moment so we can push. Now look here, notice in this that this is a practice, this is a practice. It's something you're doing. You don't know that you don't know that this is true. It's a belief. You're accepting a belief, putting it into your soul. It's a belief. And that's why it's insufficient. And that's why he then moves into book seven to then take this belief and now transform it into the formative task of moving from belief to knowing. How can you know that this is true? And that's where he's going now. And that's where, where we're going. At this stage, you have a yoga, basically. This is, this is a yoga. This is a practice. Now we're moving from this kind of yoga, classically, to a jnana yoga. This is a jnana yoga, where we're going now. That's a wisdom yoga. So this is like a preliminary yoga. Quite true. Because it just yeah. shows the level of belief. Yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. Quite true. Quite true. All right, now we move. Now, uh, let me hit a couple of things which are fun before I leave them. I put in a couple of quotes I like from the Republic. Um, this presupposes, this presupposes that someone knows that this is to one's advantage to have this idea in your mind through all of those four states, pleasure, pain, desire, and fear. So he has this statement. And it's possible for this to be the case because it had in itself a knowledge of what was to the advantage of each. This presupposes then that the lawgiver, the lawgiver has in himself 
right? the knowledge of what is to the advantage of each part of the soul and for each man. And this therefore covers both. I'd like to deal with this last one, the idea of the lie. The lie in words is an imitation of the state of the soul. All right then, all right. Then having this in your soul and expressing it and assuming this is true, assuming, believing this is true, brings about therefore a change. This change therefore allows then for, through the logos, through words, a corresponding change in the state of the soul. Now, now I want to get into the Republic Book 7. Beginning of Book 7, he says, look here, music and gymnastics, what we've discussed about before, he says, that's an education by habit. It doesn't reach into the mind. Therefore, we'll leave that and assume that our guardians have already mastered music and gymnastics and therefore are ready now to make the ascent into real being. For the ascent into real being is true philosophy. All of these are quotes from the Republic. Right? The ascent into real being is true philosophy. Into this, that's true philosophy. And therefore the goal, therefore the philosopher is he must seek to learn the studies that have the power to bring about that kind of knowing. And again, remember we used the idea of power previously, it's primarily a power. Now there are many studies now that are introduced in book seven. Arithmetic, geometry, solid geometry, um, astronomy, music or harmony, and dialectic. But now throughout the Republic, if you go through it, just do one thing and then you can follow this whole discussion. As he talks about arithmetic, as he talks about geometry and solid, which he doesn't study, uh, astronomy, harmony, and the dialectic, You can go through each one of these subjects and you can see with how much care he describes the popular way of understanding these subjects. Or as he calls it, the way the many understand it. And the way he understands it. Sometimes he calls this the higher part. Or the philosophical. So he's going to now describe uh, the philosophical heart. He's now going to study these formal studies. He's going to talk about them in the popular way, and this is the way they're taught in the schools today, so you won't have any trouble understanding that. Right? And now we want to get into the higher part of each one of these. Arithmetic. He said, you know what? No one uses arithmetic rightly. Because if you do, you see, the proper study of arithmetic is the kind of study that invites thought. Now, here's the wonderful thing about this. This is going to be our first step in confusion. All right. All right. Remember I said we're going to get a little confused? He says, you know, the study of number, the study of arithmetic must be and must have one major goal. It must invite thought, a certain kind of thought. Oh, look here, let me show you something that might invite thought. Um, if I have t two fingers and I say they're both equally a finger, you won't object to that, I'm sure, right? If I say, hey, now I got three fingers. Now. Or let me take these three fingers. It's easier with these three because they have used them before and they know all about what we're going to be talking about. Right? Now look here, each is equally a finger. And when I talk about these, we can say which one is taller than the other, can we not? Bigger than the other in respect to height? Which one is small? It doesn't cause us any concern, does it? But now what happens? 
Can we still say this is the taller? Right? Therefore, all comparative judgments, all comparative judgments based upon sense experience generates always perception. Perceptions are a certain interesting kind. When the perceptions show two opposites equally. I look here, what are two opposites? Would you agree? Uh, this, is small, this is smaller than this, and this is taller than this. So I can talk about the same thing being both taller and, taller and smaller, can I not? Mm -hmm. I can talk about this being the smallest. Therefore, whenever I'm making comparative judgments and sense experience, I can go back and forth and talk about them in one way, and then when I compare them in another way, I can attribute to them other things. Can I, can I not? That's the nature of comparative judgments. So if I have two things, one that is light and one is heavy, and then I bring two other things that are lighter and heavier than those two, then I can talk about the middle ones being light, heavy, and heavy, light. Can I not? That's confusing. So he says, it's for these kinds of things that thought must be called in to decide what the, what the perceptions are saying. Now, let me add to it now. But if some contradiction is always seen coincidentally with it, so it appears to be no more one than its opposite, then we'll need a judge to decide what we're talking about. Right. The soul must be compelled to make an inquiry to try to discover what sense is being made by the statements that are uttered. Now, as an example, would you not agree of, of two professions, we can say a soldier uh, and a philosopher are indeed different, are they not, sir? Yeah. Yeah, let me make sure. Yeah, if we get three people in a row to agree to anything, it's an eternal truth, right? <laughs> okay, all right, let's watch now. Okay, here we go. All right. Now, we're still on this curious statement. And he gives an example of what he means. And this is the one with the soldier. And the philosopher says, for a soldier must learn numbers in order to marshal his troops. And a philosopher, because he must rise out of the region of generation and lay hold of essence. So our soldier and philosopher are one. Why would it follow that they're one? That's different, they're totally different according to that example. Why would they be one? Yeah, would you not agree when we have a question like this, it's best to call upon a volunteer? Thank you. I mean, a soldier and a philosopher, in respect to one is doing one thing and another is doing another and they're different, and since they both are different and doing different things, then why would Plato say, therefore, our soldier and philosopher is one? How can two differences functioning differently end up being one? Now, sense perception certainly would see that as different. Sense perception would see that. What are we going to do? That's obviously wrong. And you always agree with that, don't you? He's obviously wrong in this case? No. Well, tell us why. I, well, I can't. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the Republic. When you don't have, you don't even need the Republic for this. What about my analogy? I don't mind analogies, please. If, if the soldier and the philosopher have a, a single purpose, uh, then the apparent, the apparent differences would be of no account. And if they have, so if, they, if the apparent differences are, are not valid, then they have a single purpose, and they would be one. Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Now, what might be the single purpose that both the soldier and the philosopher may have in respect well, to this? At the beginning, you said the purpose was to, for the many, for the one to rise up upon the many. So I would imagine 
that uh, the soldier and the philosopher have their, their own goal. I think you're quite right. Can we add to it? Come on, can we add to it from what we used Create before? Unity of the troops. Create unity of the philosopher bringing himself together as a unity. Yeah, louder. The, the soldier would bring the unity or oneness of his troops. And so would? The philosopher. Oh, good. Oh, you mean they may both need justice? No. Oh, yeah. Uh, and bravery? And temperance? Oh, in that respect, what are they doing in respect to themselves? Are they each making out of themselves a one? Oh, if that's the case, now we have a curious problem, you see. Because if he's involved in a discipline, a practice, of wanting, becoming one, and certainly the guardian as well as the philosopher would go through the same quest, he both would need Brave, bravery, would they not? Remember what we said a moment ago? They both need temperance, in terms of what he's describing as temperance, and they both need justice, do they not? Again, in terms of the way in which we just described it. And if they both are pursuing that on the same level, would they not then become out of, the, would, would, would not each become a one out of many? Might they not? Because if they mastered the things we just described a moment ago, going through the same process, would they not? Let's quickly look at it. They would both be interested in a certain power the power where they can bring the three parts of the soul together, bound together, so they make themselves a one out of many. They'd be interested in practice in preserving that condition of the soul. We do not agree. They would then, in terms of themselves, they'd have to then master themselves and make sure that the ruler within themselves is reason. And that would, be, that would then be, as it were, ruling the two other parts. And wouldn't therefore the idea of preserving uh, through pleasure, pain, and desire, and fear, what we call bravery, wouldn't that be essential to them both? If they're both going, therefore, through the same process, even though it appears from the external view, from our perceptions, that they're different, in terms of the mind, they become a oneness, were they not? Each. And therefore, as Socrates can say, so our soldier and philosophy is one. Now, here, here, look here, see. This is sort of an ideal look at the soldier, isn't it? I mean, Hitler would, Hitler's soldiers wouldn't be into justice, temperance, and bravery, would they? They might have a little difficulty staying in the service. Yeah, this yeah. particular um, army. Yeah, yeah. Those guys were but to some degree, pardon me? I was saying those guys weren't really soldiers. What the? That's the soldier. This is a soldier. Right. They, some people might argue that they were, they were people in uniform, but they weren't functioning in the, in the sense of the art of military science. I was going to bring, bring up um, a prostitute and a mass murderer and saying that a prostitute and a mass murderer, if they were to do their jobs correctly, they would need the bravery and everything. They would have to make one out of themselves so they would be identical. Yes, and a mass murderer. Yeah. Would you say then the mass murderer then would have in their, in their mind this sense of bravery? Yeah. They'd look upon the world as, per as the nature of reality as perfect and excellent yeah, and, and as good part of, as and part good. Of, yeah, and as part of the yoga, yeah. you know, they're going through the pain yeah. and yeah. pleasure yeah. I mean, and I it's my thing. I have to mass I murder. I mean, I don't take it personally. No, 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 I I'm not. I'm Where's not. the word benefit fitting into that? Yeah. If you go back to the bravery... The word section, benefit wasn't on yeah, bravery. It, it was the, the question, stay. I'm going through the pain, yeah, pleasure, yeah. etc. with the temperance. Yes, you're quite right. That's why the image of yoga doesn't fit. Because if you think of yoga, do you think of yoga as a particular practice that has a beginning and end, someone does it for a certain period of time? Yeah, this is not. This is continuous in life. 
through all pleasures, through all pains, through all fears, through all desires. So in that respect, through their whole life, they're practicing this. And if they did and turned out to be one of those serial killers, we would say, good heavens, sir, we'll have to probe your mind to, because it may be that you don't have an idea of the nature of being as being perfect. There might be something beneath it all that you really hold to be true and you're looking and seeking for revenge and things of that nature. Right? I'm not so we'd have to put revenge. them. I'm just trying to. No, we would have to. People and no, no, no. I, no, 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 no. No. See, before you do that, see, this is what makes this interesting because that's why in our society the worst thing in the world is to put men to death for their crimes. You want to bring them before a bar of justice, perhaps not a courtroom, and try to inquire what is it that led you to do that? Tap the roots of their behavior. Try to find out what influenced them, what made them what they were. Then we can learn from them. And suppose then, if we did that, we would discover that deep at the most fundamental level of their own thinking, there was, there was, right there in the nature of their soul, a false belief about the nature of reality. So that's why we shouldn't, for my sake, you know, I would say, don't throw away anybody. All men have the capability of reason should be allowed an opportunity to see themselves. But let me, I'll pull out of morality for a moment. Now look here, each one of these people then is becoming a one. Now I'd like to have a little dialogue between the soldier and the philosopher. It goes like this, all right? Um, hey, what are you doing, sitting around? Oh yeah, yeah. What are you doing, going around battling? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you do your thing and I'm doing mine, but are we not trying to do something together? And also, each one of us is trying to do something to ourselves, that is, become, most interestingly, a one out of many. Would you not agree they would both then have to say yes in terms of this dialogue? Good, now suppose one of them, and I don't know which one would raise this question, suppose one of them would turn to the other and say, you know, I too have been pursuing this idea of one for a long while, and I do believe it's meaningful, and I've done it for a long while, and I can see its advantages. But you know what? I'm not sure I know what the one is in itself. The other might say, what do you mean you don't know what one is itself? I mean, certainly you've been becoming a one, trying to become a one out of many, haven't you? Oh yeah, I'm trying to become a one out of many. Oh, you have been doing bravery? You have been going through these different states? Oh yes, I've been doing that. Well, in that respect, you've been trying, have you not, to become a oneness? Oh yeah. Well, while I'm becoming that, I'm not sure I know what that is that I have become. Well, then the two of them might say, well, then it's time to find a third to explore this question, because the thing they want to know is this question. What, after all, is the one itself? That's the fundamental question of the Republic. See, they've both, been gone, they've both gone through a process of wanting. They both try to uh, go through these practices and these disciplines, and then they try to maintain it, preserve it. They're both becoming a one, exhibiting a oneness. But now they may then turn around and say, this thing that we have become or are becoming, what would it be just to know what the one is in itself, apart from the fact that I'm in some sense, becoming it. Now for Plato, he says this question, this question, after all, what is the one in itself, is one of the studies which lead and divert the soul towards the contemplation of real being. That's what it does. That's what it does. That's what, that's what that's what the study of arithmetic leads to, the contemplation of real being, by asking what, after all, is the nature of the one in itself. What is the one in itself? This becomes an object of contemplation. That's what he calls it. Right? 
This is one of the studies which lead and divert the soul towards the contemplation of real being. This allows the practitioner to rise up from the world of becoming to lay hold of real being. I know. What does it do? It's a practice. It's practicing to make it easier, right? To make easier the change, the change from the world of becoming to real being and truth. That's what it is. It's to make it easier to make that transition from the everyday world and our views of the world into the realm of real being and truth. That's the study of arithmetic. Now, if that's the case, what do you think geometry is going to look like? Good thing we can turn the next page. Now, let me talk about what appears to be something else for a few minutes, and I'll be successful in that. Okay, good. The higher part, the higher part of a certain study makes it easy to see the idea of the good. Now, the idea of the good, I remember the symposium, the steps leading to a vision of beauty itself, Right? To have that vision of beauty itself, to see the nature of reality as beauty itself or the perfection of beauty. That's the way he describes it in the symposium. That is called the idea of the good. That is what this is, the idea of the good. Now, this word is a Greek word, idea. See, it hasn't even been translated. What this word literally means is, when we use the word idea, we consider it to be a thought, a concept, a construct. But the word means to behold, right? to behold. Right? So, to behold the good is to experience the good. That's called perfection of beauty. Therefore, to behold the good is the idea of the good. That's an experience. That's the object of experience. That's what this is, an experience. When Translators leave this with, see, it should really be a capital I if they want to keep that word idea. Because, see, watch the language. It makes it easier, see, it's right there, to see, to see the idea of the good. For it compels the soul to turn towards that reason in which is the happiest and most fortunate part of real being and which the soul must, must, by all means, see. So the higher part of this study, the higher part of the study is being, is being practiced properly only on one standard. So that compels the soul to contemplate being its proper. If to contemplate becoming, it's not proper. Now, what is this higher, what is this study we've just described? That is what he calls geometry. That's what he calls geometry. Now, he also talks about the popular use of the word arithmetic and the popular use of the word geometry. But when he understands it philosophically, that's the way, that's the way he describes it in the, in the Republic. Notice, it's not different, it is not essentially different from arithmetic. What was the goal of arithmetic? Goal of arithmetic, remember? Pardon me? Contemplation. To contemplation of real being. What's geometry? To make it easier to see the idea of the good. Right? To see it, right? That's an experience, to see it. 
It compels the soul to turn around towards that region which is the most happiest and most fortunate part of real being. That's exactly the way it's, dis it's also described in the symposium. All of these, by the way, are quotes from the Republic. So if it compels the soul to contemplate being, it's proper, it contemplate becoming, it is not. What does he call that? Geometry. Therefore, it looks like these two are quite similar, aren't they? They may be different phases of the same study. Curious, isn't it? Well, <laughs> astronomy. Everyone knows what astronomy is. Um, that business is about, is it saying that if we stop living in the here and now, I move from being to becoming, then that is not the purpose of... That's right. If you use geometry to, stu to study the physical universe, then you're studying it to, in order to contemplate becoming. That's becoming. Everyday world. It is, it is not proper. That's right. If you, if you turn it towards, the, to the, if you apply geometry into the world of becoming, it is not proper. Right. That's because right. you want it to be That's the right. real That's rather right. than That's right. being real. rather than becoming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, what's astronomy? Well, it's obviously going to be similar or different than what you consider to be astronomy, right? <laughs> Notice the way it's right. Hey, you know what? He says, you know, the way we pursue problems in astronomy is exactly the way we do in geometry. Well, how do you pursue problems in geometry? The way we just described it. Well, see, now we're studying the difficulties, the problems, the problems you encounter in the pursuit of your contemplation of real being. See, those are problems. We will pursue problems in astronomy, in geometry. Right? Astronomy must, we must come up as high as problems so as to discover which numbers are concordant, which not. And uh, uh, the, the, the whole goal then is to bring that about. To bring that about, we must bring that about. Now, uh, I would like to uh, bring you to the study of music or harmony. And I didn't put that down, but I'll, I will find a good quote for you now. I, in my haste to write it up there this evening, I skipped it. Actually, I included part of it, um, but I'd like to get you a... I'll read you the whole section so you can see how... Strange, it seems, when we read it the way he describes it. Now he's talking about uh, um, harmony. And he talks about how foolish people are who just apply their ear to the, the tunes and, and tune instruments. He said that's not anything to do with harmony. I mean, those whom we propose to question about harmonics now, they do just the same as people engaged in astronomy. What do the people engaged in astronomy do? The same as those who are engaged in geometry. Well, that's not surprising. They search for numbers in the concords which are heard, but they do not come up as high as problems or discover which numbers are concordant and which are not. So, if we can just very simply say, in harmonics, in the study of harmony, we will pursue harmony in the same way in which we, per we studied astronomy. How do we study astronomy? The same way in which we studied geometry. How do we study geometry? The same way we were studying 
arithmetic. Now, um, in yoga, classical yoga, there is a very important term called the samyama. And they talk about uh, contemplation, meditation, concentration. These are different stages or going up, concentration, meditation, and contemplation. And Patanjali says uh, they're the same. They're different stages of the same thing. They're just different stages of the same thing. Sam in Sanskrit means to take together. So when you take yama is studies, so when you take together all of the studies of yoga, you take them together, you're doing one thing in various ways. That is to say, you're doing one thing that goes through different stages. Would you not agree we have the same thing here? We have the same thing here. We have one pursuit, which is the uh, uh, most meaningful question. What is it, after all, that the nature of the one in itself? And that's explored contemptively on the level of geometry, astronomy, harmony, and now the dialectic. He says, look here, dialectic, no, pardon me. The most important thing you have to do now before you get into the dialectic is you must see the, the community and kinship between these studies, one, two, three, four, right? And the way they are related to one another. That's exactly what we were just doing. Now he enters into the realm of the dialectic. And he says, dialectic is the name given to this progress of thought through these different, so there's a different progress of thought through these. And to grasp by thought alone the real nature of the good itself. Now, I know this is pretty curious stuff, but ah, you've been through so much, you can take this one too. The good. The idea of the good. All right, we're going to call this what we did before, perfection of beauty. All right, real being. Nature of reality. You didn't miss it at all. I haven't made it. <laughs> <laughs> now, the Republic see all of these studies, and by the studies I only mean arithmetic, geometry, solid geometry, astronomy, uh, and harmony. All right. They have as their primary goal seeing this. That's their goal. which, of course, is the most, for, you know, the most important task and the most, uh, most profound part of uh, man's experience to reach and experience this most fully. In the symposium, he says, when one's contemplating beauty in itself, that's when one recognizes that the life is worth uh, the meaning of life, and this is the meaning of all existence, to contemplate the nature of beauty itself. But now look here. We can now put it back into theology, the language of theology that we use when we're in book two. God, what belongs to God, or what is God's? Now, in the Bhagavad Gita, as an example, the highest vision of Ishvara is this. There's nothing beyond this. This is the culminating vision. What's now, uh, it's the uh, uh, another name for the god of time. Okay. All right. Is that Krishna? No, no. It's not. Krishna personifies uh, the uh, highest range of reason and understanding in the Gita. Okay. Going back into this now, look here. 
This is the goal for arithmetic, geometry, solid geometry, astronomy, harmony. And if one gets this, if one reaches this experience, right? one reaches that experience, one might think one has reached the ultimate for which there is nothing beyond. That's where the dialectic in Plato begins. Because the dialectic is a rigorous use of reason, and that's all it is, a rigorous use of reason to make the distinction between the two. And the way the distinction is made between the two is only on just one single idea. This is the one in itself. I should say the one itself. So therefore, the dialectic then proceeds to examine this step by step to try to show that there must be an in terms of this, an inherent manyness, a unity, a very profound unity, but not a true one. The task of the dialectic is to make that distinction clear. Therefore, freeing this person from thinking that this is the ultimate thing possible to conceive, and therefore the highest. And therefore, it takes them out of religion into philosophy. This then becomes in th Christian theology, sometimes called the dia negativa, right? That about which you can say nothing. This is the visions possible of beholding the nature of God in a splendid, blissful state. But that is not God, right? But what is God's? That is being or the nature of ultimate reality. That's the purpose, therefore, of Plato's Republic, because he says that uh, in book seven, he says, you know, what's going on now, and this is, I, I would love to know what's behind this remark. <laughs> he says, what's going on now, he says, we, we will certainly not tolerate in our republic. And they go, oh, no, no, says Calco, oh, no, we won't do that. And thank goodness Socrates goes on to say what it is he won't tolerate. And he says, what he won't tolerate is that they are men who experience this and try to stay in that state believing they've reached the Isles of the Blessed and there's nothing beyond. <laughs> that must have been a lot of guys sitting around doing that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think guys includes women. Because in the Republic, there, there's no difference between the men and women, other than the difference is only in strength, since women can be philosopher kings. All right, all right. The, um, the first part, the good, and then the other side, the perfection of beauty, the idea of the good, real being, that's the language of metaphysics, right? Both are, yes. Yeah. And then the second part is the language of theology, right? The God, the God on the left hand side, what is God's on the right? No, this is the language of theology. Yeah, that's the language yeah, of theology, right? This is the language and of And that's the language of metaphysics. Mm -hmm. What's the language for cosmology if you were going to continue through? Well, um, 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 the, the, the most difficult, uh, which is really um, book six, seven in Plotinus, uh, deals with this whole question of how, do you, how can you understand um, this birth? Now you can talk about it as a birth, you can talk about it in many metaphors, but essentially, uh, how do you do that? Well, um, let's see now whether I, I can reflect back on it in terms of your question. The problem of cosmology is to assume that this is the, um, um, this is the idea in the mind of God. That's the Logos, the idea in the mind of God. And when God creates the universe, he focuses on this idea when he then generates the universe. Therefore, the universe is a copy of the model 
which is in the mind of God. And the difference is that this is in time, this is in eternity, therefore this has a beginning, middle, and end, right, or particular universes, right? This eternal, therefore is of the, eth this is also eternity in metaphysics, but to answer your question, mm -hmm. uh, the idea in the mind of God was the basis of a creation of the universe, and the, uh, the overflowing, the outpouring of that creative energy to generate the universe is nothing other than making manifest what lay potential in the mind of God, or manifest in the mind of God. So but in order... That idea in the mind of God is the perfection of beauty itself? Uh, well, that, see, now we're getting in, into the metaphysical side of it. Um, uh, see, but to talk about the mind of God already is making a distinction between God and mind and something in the mind and something in the God, right? So metaphysically we can't say that. Theologically we can say that because that's the language we can talk about. But in terms of uh, metaphysics, such as Plotinus and Plato, certainly Plotinus makes it easier. He says the nature of the good, the nature of the good uh, in a and a very, very interesting uh, statement. See, you can't say anything about the good, can you? On the highest level, metaphysically, it's a dia negativa. It's that about which you can say nothing. So therefore, he, he says, uh, out, of <clears throat> out of a pure nothing existent all this emerged. <laughs> <laughs> that's Kabbalah. That's also Buddhism, yeah. right? That's also Buddhism. Kabbalah, Kabbalah right? So that's that's Plotinus. Out of the pure nothing, yeah, that yeah, emerges. Yeah. Okay, in figurative language, um, <clears throat> in figurative language in metaphysics, they talk about it in terms of um, if you can do this. Um, Um, we, we don't see light, we infer the existence of light because it is reflected off surfaces, right? Light is invisible. Um, so the light, right? light itself has a source. This is its source. The source stands to the good as the light stands to the perfection of beauty and the idea of the good or the nature of ontos or reality, if you like images. Wait, say that one more time. So, uh, well, maybe I can get two for one. Well, I was just wondering how you can uh, tie in an analogy to the idea in the mind of God. Seem like you're saying that the perfection of beauty, you have an arrow drawn from the perfection of beauty, the idea in the mind of God. And I'm just wondering how that perfection of beauty generates the universe. Right, okay. Did he answer your question? Did he, did, did he push it another step? I don't know. Oh, sir. I was, I was thinking. Uh, earlier, we were, you were you know, talking about the philosopher and the soldier, and I thought that mm -hmm. that their their um, discussion uh, of their discussion of their pursuit of the one mm -hmm. would would preclude their ever their ever achieving their purpose. Because they they are it seems as though they're 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 locked into uh, they're locked into a duality that denies the one, and it also that as as I you know considering considering this discussion, mm -hmm. it seems like a discussion that the philosopher and the soldier would have that uh, we that uh, the one the one is is. Is being discussed as a as a as a multiplicity, and then the the discussion of the one as a multiplicity 
uh, it is, the experience of the one is precluded. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, the one itself has no predicates. <clears throat> well, there's no predicates. I mean, you can't say anything about it. If you do, you've, you've deviated from the idea of the one itself. So it can't be a multiplicity. This can be said to be a multiplicity because you're making distinctions within it. But it would seem also that at some point, at some point, mm -hmm. and I think that's the point that you were making, mm -hmm. at some point you have to leave the idea of the good mm -hmm. behind. That's true. Mm -hmm. That's true. Which only the dialectic can do. Right. See, this is not an experience. The, the one is not an experience. It's not an object of experience. It's not an object of experience. It's not an experience. Or if it were an experience, it would have a beginning, middle, and end. You, you could then uh, in some way contrast it with other things. It, it's not possible to contrast it with anything else. Um, I think we went over, I think uh, we see the fundamental dialectic on the one itself. The dialectic um, um, formally goes through 12 positive steps or procedures and 12 negative. Right? So when you're talking about the one <coughs> in respect to itself and everything you can say about it, right? you can say therefore a set of things that are true about it. You can also say there's certain things you cannot say about it that are false and then there's certain things you can say that might be said to be both true and false true in one way and false in another. All right. uh, then you can talk about the one that you just described and the way it can be said to relate to other things or others. And when you do that, which is what we were doing with the idea of cosmology and things like that, again you can say things that are true, things that are false, things that are both true and false. All right. All right. Now you can talk also about the idea of the one in respect to how the others relate to the idea of the one and all the ways in which it can be related among the others. And you can say three things about it, that it's true, that it's false, both true and false. And then you can also now talk about how all of these others then relate to the one. And you can say something true, false, and both true and false. Right. So that's 12 categories that you can work through. This is called the positive side of the dialectic. And for each of these then, you can also deny what must follow if you assert that the one is not. If the one is not, huh? if you say the one is not, then there's certain things you can say about it. And equally well, it follows the same structure going on the other side. So there. 24 categories in a dialectic on any subject, especially on the idea of the one. So when you're talking about the one in itself, the fundamental distinction upon which all the rest must follow is if you really mean a one to be a one, whatever you say about it, you cannot assert about it that in it is in any way of many. If you can't say in any way that it is a many, then you're dealing with the one in itself, so that therefore would you not agree you can't say then that it's a whole? Because a whole has parts. Right? So it can't be a whole. It can't be a part, because a part is a part of a whole. You can't say that it has any beginning, middle, or end, for those would be its respective distinctions. Right? You can't therefore say that <clears throat> it is in anything. All right? can't be in anything, or let's put it first, it can't be then be asserted that it's in motion, nor can it be said to be in rest. If it's in motion, then there must be some place it is and some place that it can go to, and that's already in manyness. It can't be at rest, for as it, it is at rest, there must be some place for it to be over a period of time, and therefore it presupposes a manyness three ways. Then you can see how it is the same as whether or not you can say it's the same as anything, or you can say whether it's other than anything, 
or you can then explore whether it's the same as another or other than another. And by using the same kind of, of approach, if you say it's the same as something else, that presupposes there is something else upon which you can then compare it. Right? That's a manyness. Can't say it's other than anything for the same reason, because that presupposes there must be another, which you can contrast it. That gets you out of one itself. It talks about relationships, one with other things. Therefore, in the same way, you can't say then that it's other than another, because there it isn't uh, contrastable in another, because that would presuppose a manyness. Right? So in the same way, you can't say it's in itself. You can't say it's in itself, because if it were in itself, then there would be certain points upon which it must correspond. If it's in itself, part of it must be uh, surrounding itself in, a, in some way and must be touched in certain ways upon it, and that would be a manyness. So it can't be in itself. It can't be for itself. Right? It can't be by itself, right? by the same relationships. Therefore. Given this, then, it can't be in time, for if we're in time, either the present, past, or future would presuppose something in which it is in, we denied that. Therefore, it can't have any form. Remember, we said it had no beginning, middle, or end. And anything that has a form is made up of either straight lines and curves, and therefore it has no form. If it has no form or shape, then it can't be perceived, it can't be made an opinion of it, you can't. Well, if it were by itself, right? Let's try it. Okay. Then you must then consider, must you not, that there must be something other than itself so it can be by itself. Well, does by itself presuppose that it must be that it must be in a place where there is nothing other? Well, okay. Would you agree you can use this language to mean that? Yeah, okay. So, just that we can take that out and let's use your idea of what by itself would mean. If it was everything, there's no other. So it's by itself. Yeah, okay. Uh, by the way, you called in an it. <laughs> you don't want to do that, do you? Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. If you want to call it, if, if it has a name, then there's something different between it and its name. Well, it's not. No, 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 it's not. That's the other part. That's the, no, no, if you want to say the one is not, then obviously it's another... It's something, it's everything. Okay, then it's back to being a many for you. But we said, did we not, to begin with, that our dialectic is going to be based upon one premise, that it, we're not going to make any statements that imply or well, suggest it can't, many. It can't be a many because it's by itself, which we just proved, right? Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. But would you agree if, I, if, if we use the word by itself in respect to this, then we can say it's not by itself? I, I understand what you said. Okay. If, uh, if something, if something is, is um, by itself, does that suggest there can be some place in which it can be by itself? Oh, you're thinking in terms of by meaning spatial. Spatial. Yeah. Right, so that, we couldn't use that idea. If it was limited, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it can't be limited, it's got to be everything. That, oh, uh, everything? Many? Right. It's everything? It's many? No, if it's everything, would you agree? That's going to be a many Everything. Would be one. Everything is one thing. Would it no. be everything common? is a one. Everything is one thing by itself. That's true. Then there is a plurality of many ones. Does so everything is one thing by itself. Yes, that's true. And they are many of them by itself. No, just one thing. <laughs> doesn't doesn't uh, uh, it imply uh, limitation? No, because, okay. Since it has no beginning, middle, or end, it, it, it cannot be asserted that it has any outward boundary. I would say that... And it's unlimited in that respect. About the one, but if I call, if I say that the one is an it, then I'm implying that it is something that is not something else. Okay. But that's still distinguishing it from other things when you call it an it. It's also neuter. So that's the point that I'm yeah. 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 So that you can't do that. Yeah, you can't call it. You can't that's right. call the one that's right. an it. That's right. And therefore, in the end, you can't even call it the one. Right. Because that's suggesting there's something there that you give a name to and they're different. Exactly. 
So then the name drops out too. Hmm. I can't exist. Ah, it, no, no, you, can't as, you can't assert of it existence. <clears throat> I want to change subject a second and go back to this. Mm -hmm. In many mystical traditions, the biggest danger is this stage because when you get the, I'll call it the um, idea of the good, and mm -hmm. you mix it up with the one. Oh yeah. That's the most oh, yeah. dangerous. Sure. Stage that's right. That's right. You're making it into a manliness. Yeah, good for you. That's right. Yes, I didn't mean to cut you short, but yes, you're quite right. That would be a danger. Yeah. How can one relate the idea of a simultaneous whole to the process of the dialectic? Well, simultaneous whole is another word for eternity. Okay. Eternity, uh, eternity is a um, eternity is the name for uh, the idea in the mind of God, right? Because uh, if you were to see. That means that the idea in the mind of God must be a simultaneous whole, must contain in itself all the possible manifestations that are capable of its, its uh, development. And all intelligible beings, right? Yeah, yeah. But it itself, it itself, it must contain them as a whole, simultaneous whole, no change. Therefore, that's also the idea of eternity. Which is between, well, that's not a thesis. Someone sent me on an email a set of sayings uh, that children have made. This whole discussion reminds me of this one that just popped into my mind that was on this list. Mm -hmm. It said, mm -hmm. Vacuums are nothings. We like to mention them so that they know we know they're there. <laughs> that's very good. That's very good. Good. That's very good. I like that. Yeah, that's very good. Because <laughs> we know they're there. Is, um, I did notice the solid geometry, and I'll tell you why it's important to me. If we knock out the solid geometry, then we end up with seven, and we bring back the music and gym gymnastics. We have seven uh, three levels, conditions. which goes with the mm -hmm. seven chakras, mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. the seven mm -hmm. levels mm -hmm. in Mitraism, and all mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. seven levels of initiation, mm -hmm. which. Mm -hmm. So does it really emphasize a solid geometry as opposed to normal geometry? Is it eight or seven? That's no. my question. Solid geometry, Plato insists, is something worth studying, but he says that students have such an egoistic view that it, uh, and it's difficulty in finding proper teachers for it. And the difficulty is that you can't persuade students to take such an obtruse subject, and therefore you can't offer it in this in, in, um, in the Republic. <laughs> it's got a great line. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll give it to you. Um, Which one is that? Pardon me? 327. Oh, well, why don't, why don't you read it for me? Um, after the plane surface, I said we took solids already in revolution before we examined the bottom solids with the right way is to take the third increase next after the second. This study relates, of course, to cubic increase and to forms having depth. Quite so, he said, but it seems that those problems have not yet been solved. For two reasons, I said, because no city holds them in honor, they are weakly pursued, being difficult. Again, the seekers lack a guide, without whom they could not discover. Right. More? It is hard to find one in the first place, and if they could, as things are now, the seekers in these matters would be too conceited to no. obey them. The, the, the seekers are too conceited to obey them. They got an egoistic problem somehow. So he suggests there is a very important study, but they can't find the teachers, and it's difficult to get students who can match it. <laughs> so we were thinking of putting it on the email uh, wanted uh, solid geometrician for Plato's Republic. So could the, need, the need exists. Eight chakra, which is. There, but it's just not yet. <laughs> Does he deal with the solid geometry in uh, the Timaeus? Um, could you do it with 
solid geometry and the time is. Use that as a basis for the study? No, I'm wondering if he, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, no, no, I changed your question. What was it? No, that's exactly my question. I mean, is, is the solid geometry uh, explored in the Timaeus? And yes. Could you, could you use that? As what, he's, what he's talking about here is the abstruse study. Well, the nice thing about your question is since he doesn't specify the nature of the study, uh, I could agree or disagree, and I have no basis for saying Plato might intend one over the other. We call it solid geometry in the right? Yes, he, the five regular solids in the end of the time he is represent the total universe taken as a whole. Yeah. yeah. Can, can you show yeah. me an example of that? No. That's because it's nine o'clock. Yeah. And I don't want to work on the dodecahedron and an isocahedron. I'd like to see that sometime. Yeah, well, I, I, uh, I'm, I, I think it. it um, I can get you a simple copy of it, and uh, I can urge you to do it, and I can sit and watch you do it, and that would make me feel much better than if I were to do it for you. Okay. Okay. Thank you.